get started, if you could take your seat. And we've got some live streaming today, so we're a live audience. So you let me know when we're ready to, to go. Are we on? All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Center for Imagination. We're so glad you could be here today. We have a very special guest, Mr. Darab Nagarwala. Mm. Yay! <laughs> Not only is Darab a Woodstock alumni class of 1980, but he's also a Woodstock parent and a former staff member. So he worked at the Hannibal Center and was also a middle school science teacher. So he is here today to talk to us about some of his Woodstock experiences over the years. This, as you know, is a Woodstock Tiger Tales event. Tiger Tales is our collaboration with the Alumni Office. Woohoo! And uh, our goal is to bring in really amazing Woodstock alumni who can tell us stories about their time at Woodstock and about their lives and how they were inspired by Woodstock. So again, we have a very special guest today. He'll talk to us about that, his work in the NGO field, some of his environmental activism, and some of the things that he learned from his time here that inspired his life going forward. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Darab Nagarwala. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you everyone for being here to, uh, to attend this talk. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be invited to, um, to participate in Tiger Tales. Share some uh, thoughts with all of you and and the wider uh, alumni community that uh, that might be online for the live streaming. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, just a little bit about myself. So, I came to Woodstock as a city kid in sixth grade in 1973 and uh, graduated in 1980. And uh, then I was able to, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to, uh, to get a bachelor's in environmental studies at Northland College, which is in uh, northern Wisconsin, which some of you might know is a favorite home of the polar vortex in uh, recent years. Um, and then uh, came back and uh, started to find my feet working in the, uh, in the NGO field and eventually found my way back to Woodstock after a long circle. Uh, and uh, as Jamie mentioned, uh, I, I was attracted to the Hannibal Center uh, because of my uh, sort of outdoor and environmental leanings and then uh, gradually got pulled into the world of uh, the classroom because I realized that many of the things I wanted to do with uh, children to work with them. Uh, I wasn't able to pull them out of the classroom, so I decided to go into the classroom kind of as a subversive element, you know, to try and try and find a way to get them out from the inside rather than try and pull them out. Um, so there's a few themes which I'd like to touch on in my, uh, in my talk today. And the first one is about differences. And uh, so this, is, this has been a, a, a theme, I think, uh, throughout the life of probably every Woodstock student and, and, and staff member, uh, and, and probably parent too, you know, who's ever been associated with Woodstock. Um, and so i just like to say that, you know, once you, uh, once you become a part of uh, Woodstock, it's pretty hard to just sort of smoothly fit right back into the society and the, and, and the milieu that you came from. And uh, so uh, I can definitely vouch for that and say that um, the idea of being a third culture student is very much a part of being uh, a Woodstock student. So when I graduated from Woodstock, and anyway, I didn't really feel like I, uh, I fit very well into the, into the culture I came from in, in Delhi to begin with. But when I went back, I actually was asked questions like, uh, you know, walking down the, down the street in Janpat, visiting a friend's shop, uh, people would stop me and ask me, which country you are from? And I would say, Meta Yenka? And they'd say, eh? 
you know, you, you don't you don't talk like uh, someone from Delhi. You don't walk like someone from Delhi. And uh, I had no idea that, that that you know that I looked any different or that I walked any different. And uh, you know, and uh, for a while I, I was sort of disconcerted by that. It took me aback, and I felt, oh, you know, uh, is there something wrong with me? I mean. Uh, how come I can't fit in? And then much, much later, I started to realize that uh, actually, for me, that's a strength, um, you know. And that need to that need to fit in, I think, is uh, something that you grow out of, and that's probably really necessary to do because, especially in today's world, fitting in isn't always a positive thing, you know. Um, uh, the way uh, the way we see uh, politics unfolding, the way we see things like climate change unfolding, fitting in and just kind of going with the flow uh, is not necessarily helpful for solving the world's problems, right? So I just wanted to say that uh, I have a confession to make. So there's a story that I wanted to share. Some of you are already well aware of this story. Uh, but I just want to share the story to illustrate how differences were actually valued and celebrated at Woodstock in, in my day. So everyone, uh, I'm sure, here in the audience has done embarrassing things for which they probably would have been much happier if it hadn't sort of been circulated with a wider audience. I didn't really have a choice. So on one of my first overnight hikes, uh, where I did not have toilet paper available and I didn't have a very good handle on local plants. Uh, I was attracted to a plant which had really nice large leaves, you know, very lush green leaves and I thought, oh, this would be great. <laughs> well, it turned out to be stinging nettle. <laughs> And, uh, and so that's actually how I got my nickname, which my classmates still tease me about to this day. I, I don't think I'll ever live that down to my, to my dying day. Uh, my nickname with my classmates is Botch. And uh, some of my old friends in the audience, like, uh, like Andy Alter here in the front row, uh, I th he, he still calls me by that from time to time. <laughs> So anyway, so that was an excruciating experience, but it taught me a lot. And the fact is that, you know, after doing something that embarrassing, to still actually have friends, <laughs> you know, who, who uh, don't make you feel about this high for the rest of your life is, I think, an achievement. And so I, I you know, I, I credit Woodstock uh, with, with actually uh, with cultivating that kind of environment where you can celebrate differences and you can value differences and you can laugh at yourself and you can you can laugh about embarrassing things that you've done and, and that your friends have done and it actually endears them to you even more than if they hadn't done that. So um, so I've, I've always felt that differences uh, were something that were valued and celebrated at Woodstock and you know over the years I think all of us have kind of felt like yeah you know there, there's there's been a lot of students some who have been our friends and some who haven't who have not necessarily been very academically oriented right now in a traditional school setting academics is the be all and end all it's like the holy grail of of being at school right but there's a there's so many other things out there, and at a school like Woodstock, there's so many other things going on on any given day, any given weekend. And uh, I think there have been times in Woodstock's history when that academic focus has become, uh, you know, more, uh, kind of more pronounced. Uh, I won't call it an obsession, but I'll certainly say that, you know, there have been times when Woodstock has been overly focused on academics and uh, I have no hesitation in saying that I think uh, uh, Woodstock as a school has been poorer for that 
Um, but there have been many other times where people who are not necessarily students who are not good at academics have shown that they're really good at other things, you know, like sports, like music, or, or amazing at drama, for example. Um, there have been some recent examples uh, of, of students like that. And uh, I think that the fact that they have been valued, they, 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 uh, their talents have been acknowledged, have actually um, helped them to grow tremendously as, as people, you know, and, uh, uh, and go on to do really great things in, uh, in later life. Um, and of course, um, to kind of say a little bit more about that theme, um, just getting involved in, in things other than academics has always been something that I found very enriching. Uh, of course, I never understood why that was. Uh, now I think there's ample evidence to say that when you get involved in creative things like music and art um, and drama, uh, it engages your right brain. And if, uh, if you're only sort of uh, nerdy and geeky and, and academic focused, then that's more kind of left brain. And it's really important that you engage both sides of your brain and, and that those creative things aren't actually taking away from your academics, they're actually enriching your academics and, uh, and actually helping you excel at academics. And I have to say that, that uh, uh, over the years I've seen so many students who have been valedictorians and salutatorians and whatnot and many, many of them have been extremely good at music, art, drama, and those kinds of things as well, you know? Um, and so it's not, it's not an exclusive thing, you know? So please, uh, please remember that, you know, right brain and left brain go together. It's really important to uh, engage both to be a, to be a complete person and, um, uh, and that, that's, just, that, that's just for the students out there. Um, okay, uh, an another couple of stories I wanted to share about being here um, a as a sixth grader city kid was uh, there was something uh, akin to rites of passage that you had to go through when you first come to Woodstock. And um, as a sixth grader, one of those rites of passage I had to go through was exploring the hillside with a, with a group of sixth grade boys who were my classmates. And uh, somehow getting, getting between a rather angry uh, bull, which had been uh, sort of uh, prepped to charge me, and having my friends who were with me suddenly disappear, and having this bull charge me. Um, but it, it was all fun in the end, you know? So I, I managed to escape. Uh, the bull ran down the hill and, uh, and, and couldn't find me. I ran up the hill uh, somewhere else and my friend suddenly, uh, you know, magically reappeared. A little while later, we were reunited and then we all were able to laugh about it. Now, much later, I found out that the whole thing had been engineered to see how well I could cope with having, you know, <laughs> having a bull charge me. Um, and of course, uh, uh, things like, there were several rope swings on the hillside, uh, and uh, the technique was you basically you wrap the rope around yourself a couple of times and just swing out over the, over the hillside and, and come back. And if someone happens to yank that rope while you're sitting there, sometimes you, you might find yourself actually hanging upside down from that rope uh, and swinging out over the over the hillside. So that was another rite of passage that uh, that I experienced as a sixth grader. And uh, again, that's one of those things that I think helped the bonding experience. Uh, um, so anyway, uh, so that's that's. Uh, what I wanted to say about differences, um, the, and, and of course involvement in Woodstock events, so um, I think hiking and camping was kind of a natural for me because 
we were always broke. Uh, there was there were no opportunities to have a bank account or hide money under your pillow or anything like that. And uh, if you went to the bazaar, then you were always left thinking, oh, I wish I could, you know, buy that or eat that. So there was no point doing that. So it was always, you know, I always felt better off going in the opposite direction and having adventures instead. So um, hiking and camping then became kind of a mainstay and I think that was sort of a, a very important bonding that I had and uh, I, I'll ask uh, Andy to, to share uh, an experience that we had of hiking in the dead of winter up to, up to Gangotri. <laughs> <laughs> a little later. But a uh, couple of experiences hiking I wanted to share. One was in the monsoon and a group of friends and I decided we were going to hike down to Thatyur and uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly why but we found our way down there and uh, the block development office was half built then. It was basically just a bunch of empty rooms so we decided we'd spend the night there. And uh, we cooked a meal, and uh, you know, and you know, built a fire, and you know, had a nice chat and all that. And uh, it started to rain, and it rained and it rained, and we fell asleep. When we woke up in the morning and looked out of the non-existent doorway, the bridge was gone. There was no connection between. Tatyur and the uh, and the outside world, especially you know the the way back to Missouri, and uh, the that small innocuous river called the Agla had, had become a raging torrent. There were entire trees floating down, you know, with all their roots intact. It it was pretty scary. But somehow, by afternoon of the same day, the villagers had managed to throw some ropes and cables across, and they built enough of a bridge that we were actually able to cross the river and get to the other side, but uh, it couldn't take the weight of us with our backpacks on. So we had to leave our backpacks behind. And even then, uh, we had to tie our shoes around our necks because it was too slippery with shoes. And the very middle, the bridge was sagging so much that your feet were actually underwater as you, as you cross the river one false step and uh, you would have been you would have been a few kilometers down the river in the matter of minutes so quite exciting really <laughs> really quite exciting and uh, yeah another another uh, incident um, I went hiking up to uh, Dorita with, with a classmate of mine who had just uh, been gifted a, a new fishing rod and he was uh, totally excited, you know, about his fishing gear and fishing tackle and everything that we forgot all about taking a pressure cooker. Now, Dodital is uh, close to 11,000 feet. Actually, I think it's a little over 11,000 feet. And um, water boils at a lower temperature uh, the higher you go. Water probably boils at somewhere around 97 degrees Fahrenheit, 97, 98 degrees Fahrenheit uh, at Dodital. And that's actually not hot enough to cook rice or dal. So we, we had date cheese that we'd taken, we built a fire and we tried cooking uh, rice and dal and the water kept boiling down and we kept pouring in more water and it, it boiled down and the rice was still raw totally kacha after an hour, the dal was even more kacha. We were literally at our wit's end because, you know, we were really hungry at that point. And then a survey of India party landed up about 15, 20 people and they had like five pressure cookers. And so they, they had pump stoves, they set everything up and started cooking in about 15 minutes they had their whole dinner ready. And we were just sitting there watching them. <laughs> but thankfully they were, they were, um, very uh, kind, and after they they were done cooking their dinner, they uh, they allowed us to use a couple of their pressure cookers, and so we actually had dinner that night. 
but uh, it was it was a really really big lesson in in being prepared, and also in uh, you know uh, about physics and chemistry, and <laughs> and of course much later um, I realized that um, local villagers do have techniques. You know they they have their own versions of uh, pressure cookers and they use um, they use you know um, cook well. What we call gharas, or uh, like water pots, which are kind of uh, they have a, a smaller neck and a wider sort of body, and uh, they actually use a uh, dough to kind of seal the seal the top. So they put they put a lid on the top and they seal it with dough, and that's what actually helps to build up enough pressure to uh, to cook things like rice and dal and and meat. But of course, we didn't know that at the time. And we didn't have one of those, those uh, kind of ghanas. So, yeah, big, big learning experience. Um, I want to come to another important theme, and that's mentoring. And uh, I think that's been a really, really important uh, aspect of of being a Woodstock student, and not just student, but even a staff member and a parent, because. I feel like I've been mentored by so many different people um, over the years, um, including uh, including people from the community. You know, um, so what happened was uh, a, another incident. I, I just want to uh, uh, you know I just want to illustrate this. So uh, on the same no sorry this was a different hike but also to Dodital in the dead of winter. Um, and we, uh, my, my friend and I, my classmate and I came back from Dodital and uh, our bus broke down at uh, Chamba. And we, we were basically stranded with like 5 rupees each in our pocket. And the bus conductor and driver just completely disappeared. The bus was just sitting there by the side of the road and we didn't have enough money to actually get back to Missouri. And my my classmate actually was flying out to. He needed to reach uh, Missouri the next day, and then uh, I think the very next day he needed to get a bus down to Delhi, and then he had a flight to to catch to Dhaka because his parents lived there. So it was, you know, uh, a kind of urgent that we that we get to Missouri. So we didn't know what to do. Um, it was getting towards evening, so we sat down at a, at a local uh, sweet shop and decided, well, let's at least have some chai, you know, and a little barfi. And so we sat down there and we started chatting, what are we going to do, this, that. And the sweet shop owner just sort of walked up to us and said, uh, what's the problem? You seem, uh, you know, a little hassled. Uh, is there anything I can help you with? So. Uh, we explained to him the situation. He said, Are, why are you worried I'm here? No? <laughs> and so uh, next thing you know, he's, uh, you know, he's got, again, he's got, you know, rotis and sabji going on his stove. And uh, so we slept in his shop that night, well fed and everything. And uh, the next morning we were fast asleep. He woke us up and said, your bus is here. And he had uh, he had sort of found the bus, uh, paid our fare, and uh, stopped the bus from leaving without us, and said that you know if you ever happen to come back this way again, you can uh, you can reimburse me. Otherwise, don't worry about it. So you know that that's the kind of uh, uh, friendship and and mentoring and uh, that uh, I have received. From, from the community and uh, obviously from you know various staff members who have um, you know passed on their expertise and uh, who have like encouraged me to uh, to to come out of my comfort zone like like my my friend here and the altar um, so on his behalf I uh, I traveled to various villages for his ethnomusicology project with a cameraman with a uh, bulky camera equipment uh, on a on a motorbike, and uh, and uh, had the had the enjoyable experience of actually videoing uh, traditional drummers drumming, and and maybe maybe Andy can tell you a little bit more about that uh, experience.
experience because we, we went out together as well to, to sort of follow up on that. Um, but that's another, that's just another example of getting involved with things which are not in your academic, uh, you know, curriculum. Uh, just to learn more about, you know, where, where you live and making connections with people who you don't uh, normally come in contact with. Um, so, uh, and then building friendships is the next theme that I want to get to. And I have to say that um, the friendships that I've built here at Woodstock, uh, not just as a student, but again, as a parent and as a staff member, uh, are there for life, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, having lived in the dorm for uh, a number of years, 24-7, with, uh, with a bunch of your peers, uh, that's, that's your family. So, you know, and you spend so many months of the year uh, here that, uh, you know, it's a majority of your year for several years. So that's, uh, that's your family, you know. You, you grow up with them and you, uh, you, you have this shared set of experiences which you uh, it just sort of, you, it gives you an automatic connect which, which lasts a, a lifetime. So it doesn't matter how often you keep in touch with your Woodstock friends. When you do connect, it's like, um, it's seamless, uh, you know? And uh, I think that's, that's just, that's been a really special part of, uh, of, of being a Woodstock, whatever, you know, staff, student, uh, uh, whatever. So, so yeah, um, the other thing is that, uh, I have, I have also learned things from, uh, from younger people. So it's not necessarily people who are necessarily older than me. Uh, I, have, uh, I have learned things from my students. I have learned things from, uh, from much younger people who have experienced uh, during my uh, you know, hiking and camping adventures um, and on field trips and so I think it just sort of, you know, that learning cuts across all age groups. So it's cross-cultural and it's cross-generational. And um, I feel like that's, the, that's really the beauty of, uh, of the Woodstock experience, that you actually get an opportunity to learn from, from people who aren't necessarily just your teachers, you know? Uh, so... Yeah, that's been special, and um, uh, and all this is kind of um, led to a particular worldview, I guess, for for lack of any other way of um, putting it. Um, so, just wanted to share a, a little bit about uh, you see me sitting here in front of you, what I am today as a person, how being here as a student has actually made me what I am, and so I I would say that. Um, you know, with, with uh, the sort of combined experience of being here as a student kind of left me with a lot of uh, grat gratitude for uh, everything which, uh, which I was given. Um, so all that, uh, you know, all the love and affection, the bonding, the, the fun, the adventures, the, uh, you know, the there's some stories which I think I won't get into, <laughs> but all the you know the mischief and pranks and all of that, which which are also a part of of being a student here at Woodstock, uh, and um, and also like this 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 amazing uh, natural environment that we have around us, uh, you know the forest, the uh, the animals, the birds, the um, the, 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 the everything, everything around us, and just even even the, the fresh air and the beautiful sunsets, and uh, so both both the aesthetics and plus the sort of the, the physicality of of the surroundings. Um, and I feel like I'd taken so much by the time I left Woodstock uh, that I really needed to give something back, and that's really what brought me back here. Um, as a staff member, um, as a parent, um, and 
I, I really feel like uh, like being here at Woodstock taught me that uh, that what what we have is precious. Uh, our natural environment and uh, and uh, our you know uh, our social and, and and cultural values of, uh, of people who live in these villages around us. Um, all these things are precious, and. Uh, you know, we, we need to we need to protect that for uh, future generations, and uh, uh, we're going to need to we're going to have to fight to actually protect it because uh, uh, things are changing way faster than we had ever imagined, and going in different directions, uh, and you know the 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 kind of um, small you know choices that we make today we realize they're actually part of something much, much bigger because we're fitting into systems that we don't even realize that are impacting um, the world on a, on a global scale and climate change is very much one of those, you know. At the same time, I don't, uh, I don't believe in doom and gloom scenarios at all. I, I believe in the, in the power of, uh, of individual actions and I think we've seen over and over again that you know just one or two people can actually change a lot of things uh, when they you know when, when, when they can when they can get their voices heard so uh, I do believe that what we have is worth fighting for and I guess that's what kind of led me to uh, sort of work with NGOs and uh, do some work with forestry because uh, I, I just you know developed this uh, love of trees and forests and things um, and also uh, now living in Pune uh, having been away from the hillside for a couple of years getting involved with issues which um, are important to a, to a city like that you know a city which actually was settled there because of the confluence of two rivers um, but the rivers are so polluted now that um, they're almost dead um, so, so just trying to, you know, work with other citizens who are concerned to try and uh, bring more awareness about what's happening to the rivers and, and trying to make more people aware of what's happening and try and put pressure on the authorities to do something about it, you know. And uh, obviously that's a very uphill task, but the point is that uh, every single bit counts. I think that's that's the important thing. So, not to get disheartened, but just to keep plugging away um, and standing up for what you believe in, you know. Um, and of course, the idea of communicating what you value, what you believe in uh, your uh, your your convictions to uh, the next generation. So, I think that that you know that idea of communicating and maintaining some kind of continuity of culture, uh, whether it's school culture or, or, or whether it's a, you know, a broader culture. Uh, I, I feel like my, uh, my Woodstock experience has also kind of ingrained that in me, that it's really important to just continue to communicate the things that you, uh, that you believe in, you know, to, to the next generation. And, um, that's the reason why I chose to start working here. Um, and uh, at this point, uh, I, I'd like to bring my friend into the conversation. Yeah. So, Andy, if you could, if you could join me up here and, and share a few of your thoughts on any one of these. <laughs> the, actually, why don't you sit here and I'll, I'll yeah. So, uh, Mr. Nagarwala has put me in the hot seat. <laughs> Here comes the hot seat. <laughs> um, I, I fully concur with everything that Dharav has said. And <laughs> obviously we've been on many treks and hikes together over the years. And when he came in sixth grade, I... I was not to blame for anything that happened. <laughs> they, they weren't my fault at all. <laughs> I, was, I was one of the good students who would ensure that every new student would have a great time at Woodstock <laughs> and was welcomed 
immediately. Okay, occasionally it wasn't that way. But, that's <laughs> but he did mention this one hike that we did do together. Uh, we went up to uh, Gangotri in the middle of winter when we thought, okay, this is the best time to go because there's no one else up there. And that's why we should go. So he, myself, and my, our friend Mark Lichty came together. Um, our first problem was that the road 40 kilometers down from Gangotri itself had washed away. So we had to stop and start walking from at least two days trek before we even got to Gangotri. These were the days when there weren't the, the roads weren't that good. And so we had to start walking and as we started walking up it began to snow and it got worse and worse. <laughs> And so we had only, as usual, we would plan well ahead. And that meant we would make sure we had at least one pair of sneakers for hiking in. That's all you needed. <laughs> and so our sneakers were completely wet in the snow as we were going up higher and higher. But there's no way of coming back down because there's no, you know, it's like another day down that way. So we kept going, kept going. Until we finally, in the middle of the night, arrived in Gangotri. There was only one person who would take us in, an old sadhu, <laughs> who had decided he was going to stay there the whole time, throughout the whole winter. And luckily he had made this decision. I don't know why he had made that decision, but <laughs> for us this was the best decision of his life, for our life. <laughs> and we were able to then get warm next to his, his fire before we were able to uh, then take I think we actually ate with him as well. Yeah. But then we were able to help him give back some of our food too. But that was only one of the many treks and hikes that Darab and I went on together. <laughs> I had totally forgotten that I had asked Darab to help me with my music projects later on. And I had sent him off to, said, go video and get some videos of drummers because I can't be there to do all of this. And so, thankfully, he did this because I still have many of the old VHS recordings done of different drummers in different places. And believe it or not, <laughs> look, I hope I gave you a big footnote in my first book. <laughs> I think there's a big, at least one footnote, if not two, thanks to that I've done about. Because there were aspects of the drum repertoire that, okay, I'm jumping way ahead here, sorry. My interest, for those of you who don't know me, is ethnomusicology. And one of the things that I've studied and worked on is the drumming of this region. Learning some of the repertoire and what happens in villages in drumming, I have to credit that art for. <laughs> uh, True, I took his tapes and then I sort of did some analysis and uh, performed some magic on it and then figured out what was going on. But thanks to Darab's tapes and that, I actually discovered a whole set of repertoire drummers used for different ceremonies in the hills here, including a set of uh, particular rhythms that are used to accompany wedding uh, processions through the hills, and you know, you have this one to take the bride out of the house, this one to go down a hill, this one to go across a bridge, and then when you're going on a U-bend, well, you have to watch out for ghosts, so you have to play this one to make sure that the ghosts don't attack you when you go backwards, and so, all of these kinds of things. I credit you with that. <laughs> so, in terms of mentoring, he may have said I mentored him on some things that I, I won't uh, give you the full stories, his mentoring of me, thankfully, has led to a whole career in uh, musicology, uh, which, uh, you know, and has allowed me to publish a couple of books in which he gets a footnote or two. But that's, that's most appreciated. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for that, Andy. Uh, <clears throat> I want to open the, open the floor for questions. Uh, can I pass the mic to you? Yeah. We'll see. Uh, two questions. Yeah. One, did I miss the botch story? 
You missed it. You're too late. <laughs> so, yeah, I heard it in seventh grade, but I just wanted to. He actually was one of the. Oh, okay. One of the favorite few who was the favorite. I don't know. <laughs> Not one of the few. <laughs> I, I submitted a couple of assignments saying, "Dear Mr. Botch, uh, no, I got consistently great to go for, but." Um, my second question was about uh, your water conservation. Um, ah. So you're working with the Muna Mutha in Pune right now. Yeah, and so so there is a group of concern. Um, so there is a group of concerned citizens in uh, Pune um, who are extremely concerned about um, there's a new river redevelop riverfront redevelopment project which is being floated by the municipal corporation and uh, there's a group of citizens who are extremely concerned about that because uh, it's talking about basically um, kind of developing the, the, the river banks, making them more accessible, commercializing them, um, bringing in the flood lines um, to kind of uh, allow more building, um, but basically not doing anything much to, to, uh, to stop the pollution of the river. Um, and so that's an issue of major concern because just thinking about if you're going to open up the riverfront to people and make it more accessible uh, and have uh, food joints and, and places like that for people to come and for recreation, you need to have a clean river for that, you know? So spending a lot of money on, on that doesn't make sense unless you clean up the river first. So that's, that's what this group of citizens is, is really uh, is fighting for under the banner of Safe Pune Rivers. And uh, so I came across uh, this group because of uh, uh, an old school friend of mine, uh, Dr. Sara Ahmed, who has founded uh, a virtual museum on water called the Living Waters Museum. And uh, because of her networking, she had made contact with this group um, there's another group that's kind of uh, part of it, but uh, uh, is is um, kind of spearheading the whole thing called Jeevit Nadi, mm. the Living River Foundation. And, and their whole concept is, you know, that um, rivers need to be, need to be living, uh, not just, uh, uh, you know, uh, water, water flowing. So uh, I've, I've been volunteering at some events that this group has hosted, including uh, a couple of flash mobs uh, where, you know, at some parts of the city where college students tend to, tend to congregate. Uh, and, uh, and also at a, at a couple of uh, running events. So Pune does have a, a, a sports culture and there's a couple of pa uh, areas in the city where uh, uh, people get together and, and, uh, and run. Um, the last Sunday of every month. In fact, the group is called LSOM, last Sunday of the month. And they regularly host uh, running events. They get sponsors, they get corporate sponsors. So I've volunteered at a couple of those events where people from the St. Pune Rivers group have gone with their placards and banners and basically just talked to people, handed out uh, pamphlets, tried to get names and phone numbers and email addresses. To, to get more people aware of what's going on. Um, the second thing is uh, right now the, uh, there's also another uh, project to basically build more roads, roads and tunnels connecting parts of the city through some of the hills. Pune has five major hills within the city uh, which, are, uh, which are really important green spaces for recreation, for, um, um, for people to go for morning walks, um, take their dogs out for a walk, um, uh, go running, go mountain biking, uh, or generally just de-stress also, you know? Um, and those are kind of coming, increasingly coming under threat um, uh, for building roads and things. So there's also a group of citizens that are um, 
trying to oppose those uh, those kinds of projects. So I've been I volunteered at a couple of their events as well. Um, and in the past, I had also um, I had also volunteered with some some other groups, uh, which had been pushing for more rights for people who live near forests and who depend on forests for their livelihood. You know, like tribals in other parts of India who collect things like tendu, uh, tendu patta, which is a leaf that's used for rolling beads, uh, and, uh, and maua, uh, maua flowers, um, um, and, and maua fruit, which is used to actually make cooking oil. So tribals in central India actually use this oil to cook with. Um, and uh, they also brew a very, very famous local liquor from maua flowers, and that's also a source of income for them. So those kinds of, you know, forest produce uh, uh, are extremely important to some of the poorest people in the country. And so I have volunteered with some groups that have been trying to um, push for more rights for them. Any other questions? Any other questions? Comments? Michael? Comments. Yeah, thank you so much. It's really good for those of us who are still here to realize that we're currently part of something that will last into the future. Um, my question, and I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but at the time that you were a student here, um, did you did you consider yourself to be an exception to the to the mainstream student Woodstock student? Meaning, in your interests, in your um, in your recognition of what you were being, what was being bestowed upon you here, do you think you shared that with the rest of the student body? That's a that's a really important question, Martha, and I. I not sure how to respond to that because it was a long time ago and and I think in many ways I was also trying to fit in just like uh, just like you know my classmates and um, but at the same time I guess I, I was aware that I was a little different you know in in my interests and and that maybe some of those differences uh, I had had come about because of because of the parenting I had. So I was able to relate to um, people who were much older than me, uh, and, and also people who were who were younger. Um, and I think that was not something that uh, that we could take for granted as as students so and, and also I think you know that those I had been brought up not to be classist I think my parents were very very firm about that uh, and so even now I have uh, very good friendships with uh, you know employees at the school and uh, you know people uh, you know who, who, are, who have been part of our support system here at Woodstock, who I think sometimes we tend to take for granted. So in that sense, I guess I was a little different, but I didn't really, you know, back then I didn't really feel that different. But yes, there, there were times I think, um, especially after leaving Woodstock when I did feel kind of lonely because I I, I, I didn't feel like uh, I was understood where I was coming from. And uh, at times I felt that even as an adult. Um, I felt that as a student as well. But I feel like there were others who also felt the same way. And who were going through maybe way more difficult times than I was, you know. Um, and I would say that uh, that for for people who weren't necessarily uh, Indian, but who had who had maybe been born here in India or maybe had 
come to India as very young children and grown up here um, and then thinking about actually going back to their native country for higher studies um, well, you know, I could see a lot of, uh, you know, there was a lot of anxiety and uh, I didn't feel that. You know, I didn't feel as anxious about uh, getting into Delhi University as some of my friends felt who had grown up in India and were going back to the States. Uh, for, you know, for, for them and almost feeling like the first time and feeling like they were going back to a foreign country. I don't know if that answers your question at all. <laughs> Andy, do you want to respond? Well, uh, sort of, one, one of the things back in those days when Rob's talking about, I, I was in a privileged position. <laughs> I was son of the principal. And so I, I could roam the hillside and I didn't have to go into the dorms. And so I was kind of outside of that. And I have to admit that I probably was not aware of a lot of the feelings and angst and things that some of the uh, students in the dorms, like Darab and others, uh, would have been feeling at that time. So for me, everything seemed to be, a nice, you know, I had rosy tinted glasses on and everything was nice and, and everything flowed smoothly. Um, at the same time, I think there was a little bit of that uh, and I think there still is, that because we're a smaller school and we don't have the large classes, they, there, there was never a feeling of a particular clique or a group that you were part of and you weren't part of that group and something else. So I've heard stories of other schools where, you know, there's that group that is, you know, clearly against another group over there. We never sensed anything like that. And so, uh, you know, the, whether you're different is both a perception of, your, of yourself by yourself as well as a perception of others of you and within both, well, from others looking at, you know, the, our colleagues, we didn't see any difference amongst, you know, Darab and myself or other students because we were all just uh, part of the same group. I'm sure each of us individually would have had some sense of a difference that, uh, you know, at school may have been there that I personally wasn't aware of because I was in a more privileged position. Just one little bit, sorry to go on. <laughs> so when I went back to college uh, in 1978, um, of course I was different to everyone else because I had left Woodstock and Woodstock was a different place. Going into the dorms at college in the United States, I initially thought, oh, this is going to be terrible. I mean, who am I? What am I going to figure out? What's going on? Until I realized I had a lot more confidence than almost all the other students in the dorm. <laughs> I suddenly realized that oh, they were having a much worse time coming from Denver, Colorado, or from Michigan, to Connecticut where they were out of their norm. Whereas for me coming from Woodstock to there, somehow I had a confidence about the fact that I was going to be different anyways. So it didn't matter what happened. I would survive because I've always been different. And it was in fact true that I sort of uh, ultimately was a lot more confident than a lot of the other students at college, or I, I felt that anyway. But it took me a year or two to figure that out. Yeah, I think that's that's a really important uh, uh, message for uh, for students. Um, and yeah, I mean that's a, it's a really tough it's a really tough question. That whole idea of uh, you know of wanting to belong, of of wanting to fit in, to you know to to have a group that you can be a part of and and feel valued and and feel accepted uh, for what you bring to the table, um, you know, your own unique set of, of, uh, of gifts. Uh, and I think it's, a, it's quite a, it's a really delicate balance. And uh, I know that uh, it, it really hasn't been easy for, for a lot of students. Uh, I, I honestly, I feel like, you know, what Andy's saying, 
there really is a vast, uh, vast difference between uh, the culture, I think, of the student body uh, in, in those days. We're talking about the 1970s um, uh, compared to now, you know, it's what we call a, a different jamana. <laughs> you know, in Hindi the word is jamana. It's, it's very different. The, uh, the, the social norms, um, the expectations, uh, and I think the need for uh, students to, to, to maintain a certain level of, of, uh, of you know, of dignity and, um, you know, I, I, I feel like back then uh, we, could, we could afford to be undignified <laughs> <laughs> in many ways. I am still very undignified. <laughs> Questions, comments? Yes, come. I'll, I'll repeat. No, 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 please, 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 please. I'm just wondering because you were saying Gangotri and all of these tracks, that, um, and roads, of course, and now because there's this new four lane that's being built and all of this fancy talk around. And I'm sure you've seen some of this happen while you were here. I'm just wondering how, you know, like on these tracks, hardship means, which you realize later in life, I suppose. It means a lot of perspective and I suppose it also gives you something to keep with you for a long time. But now that these roads are coming and tracks are also a lot more easier, you get to these places in like, I don't know, much, much faster than perhaps you did it. So I'm wondering if, you saw things change and how these roads impacted what life is in the hills and if you could maybe just share what you saw mm -hmm. over the years. Next time I'll have two mics. <laughs> um, I, I think I've, uh, I'm, I'm getting close to overstaying my welcome at the CFI, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this brief. Um, you know, Vineet, that's a, that's a really important question. Um, and I have to say that my views about roads in the hills have actually changed a lot over time. So for the longest time, uh, to me, you know, coming from, coming from a, a, a sort of place where the mentors I had kind of pushed me in the direction of, you know, that any form of development, particularly roads, were, you know, destructive and damaging uh, to society, to the environment. I've come around to realizing that from, from the villagers perspective, roads have actually, uh, they've, they've brought a lot of, um, they brought a lot of benefits, which had never really occurred to you know, so from, from their point of view, I have to say that um, roads have been quite destructive, the way they've been built, you know, hillsides being blasted with no thought of uh, what the geology is and creating like landslide after landslide, year after year, and you know, patch up jobs. Uh, but at the same time, you know, um, villagers getting access to uh, uh, to LPG cylinders, um, to faster, you know, access to medical facilities um, and things like that. It's a, it's really with a very, very mixed feelings that I have seeing the development of the, of the four lane highways and thinking of the, uh, the extra tourist traffic and the extra burden on the environment. Uh, and at the same time, realizing that hopefully it's bringing more jobs and uh, improving a, a standard of living um, of the people who are working in those dhabas and, and providing the, those services. So I have to say, you know, for me, I think the jury will always be out on that. You know, it's just totally mixed feelings because I can clearly see both sides and uh, 
I, I just don't know. I, I just I just don't know what to say, you know. Um, but I guess I would have to say that I do stand on the on the side of the local people, and I, I just wish that there's more thought to the destructive aspects, and that there could be more control. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I think it's the uncontrolled nature of of what is happening around us that's the problem. You know, Andy, a, a comment? Uh, nothing really to add on that. I don't think. Thank you so much, Darab, and our special guest, Andy Alter. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thanks for joining Tiger Tales, and we'll see you next time.